Greetings, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today, we learn about our unique planet, how it evolved, how it works. Andrew Knoll is the Fisher Professor of Natural History at Harvard University. He's also curator of paleobotanical collections at the Harvard Yeah. And looking beyond Earth, he's also part of the science team for NASA's Mars Exploration Rover mission. Dr. Knoll has received many awards for his research, which has established the connections between geology, chemistry, and life in Earth's history. He's also the author of two books for general readers, and today he'll discuss the most recent one, A Brief History of Earth, Four Billion Years in Eight Chapters. This is a must-read for those curious about how the Earth and life developed, and perhaps especially the relationship between natural catastrophes and subsequent developments like life and evolution. Further, the book explains the human impact on our planet and just at the right moment. We are honored to welcome Dr. Andrew Knoll. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Yvonne, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Dr. Knoll, I'd like to start by asking about uh, the, the book just in general. Um, that this is how this should be uh, presented in courses, for example. I know that you have a famous course at Harvard University, but uh, would you agree that this is the way to teach this kind of subject? Well, um, I'll leave it to others to say whether it's, it's the right way or not. It's the way that comes naturally to me because I've you know, worked on various issues of Earth history for, for decades. And I, I must admit that when I wanted to try and put the whole narrative together from the beginning until the 21st century, um, I'm naturally drawn to something that many textbooks don't talk about, and that is the, the, the sort of conversation between the physical and biological yes. Earth uh, as it's played out over 4 billion years and as it's taking on a fairly new and dramatic tone in yes. the 21st century. So whether it's the best or not, it's, it's what comes naturally to me. Well, the other thing is that, that we, on the outside here, non-specialists, we may have had a course in geology, a course in biology, a course, you know, in this and that, yeah. but you never put all of these things together in this way. And when you do, the planet and its life emerge. One of the things that it seems to emphasize is this synergy, these interrelated forces and structures and categories, features, it's like one huge organism. And I wondered if, is, is that your point or one of your points? Yeah, certainly, you know, historically over most of the last 200 years, as different scientific disciplines developed as, you know, professional disciplines, uh, they didn't talk to each other very much. Right. So geology developed, biology developed, and even though, and, and one has to be, be honest here, in the early 1800s, uh, Alexander von Humboldt said very clearly that you can't understand life on this planet without understanding the planet itself. And even a little bit further back, James Hutton, who is generally yes. regarded as the founder of modern geology, talked about Earth as a superorganism. Uh, now, in fairness, uh, Hutton's issue was, you know, he could walk around the hills of Scotland and see that erosion was tearing those hills down. He could see that the uh, sand that was generated by that erosion was going down out into the Firth of Forth and filling it in. So his question was, how can, when environments are in a constant state of decay, how can life persist? And his, his solution was actually to make the earth dynamic, that this mountain might be uh, being worn down, but somewhere else heat is driving another mountain up so that there were always environments available for life. It isn't clear that 
when Hutton was talking about a superorganism, he really meant that organisms were playing an active role in maintaining the earth. For him, it was really a metaphor. But, but nonetheless, the, the, it's one of the early expressions of the idea that this is a system and we can't understand it by just looking at its parts in isolation. Yes, uh, absolutely agreed. But you've done a splendid job on this, and, and I thank you, and I hope that that uh, even teachers will look at this, because it's accessible, certainly, to high school and uh, probably middle, middle school. It's just a great way to introduce something that uh, I'm sorry to say we have to learn today. I mean, it, 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 because we're responsible for things that are happening to the planet and to the life on it. And so uh, it's a responsibility of all of us to learn how this planet works. And anyway, thank you. And I'll go then to ask uh, after that, then the major geological features I, uh, uh, about our planet, could you please give us an idea about the, the structures and the the uh, processes that are so critical. Yeah, let me give one example of structure and then one example of, of process that, okay. and, and these, again, these things are not independent, um, right. but we can go from there. So if you uh, were to cut the earth in half and look at it in cross section, it would look something like a hard boiled egg in that there is a central part, which is called the core, uh, that's made mostly of iron, but with an admixture of lighter elements like sulfur and, and, and oxygen. And the core is important for a number of reasons, but one of them is that the core itself is divided into two parts. The inner part is solid. The outer part is actually liquid and it convects through time. That is, the, the liquid core at the base of that layer heats up. It rises because it's less dense, and then it'll come back down again. And we are the beneficiaries of that because it is that um, movement in the, in, in the outer core that actually generates Earth's magnetic field, and that shields us from all sorts of uh, harmful radiation. So the core, even though it's very difficult to actually study because it's in the center of, of the planet, is hugely important. Outside of that, and really constituting the, the majority of the volume and mass of, of the Earth is something called the mantle. Now, the mantle is mostly made up of uh, materials that have silicon dioxide in it. That's quartz in its pure form. They're called silica, silicate uh, minerals. And again, although the mantle is solid on long time scales, it convects. Mm -hmm. And that convection is responsible as the driver of almost everything we see at the Earth's surface. So the mantle is in intimate contact with, with the surface and affects what we see around us. And then finally, the, the uppermost layer of the Earth called the crust is sort of equivalent to that, the eggshell. And frankly, it's not much, you know, that's about the right scale of, of mm -hmm. uh, relative size. Uh, the continents are made of one kind of crust made up in no small part of granite, which you'd see in the White Mountains or the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and the oceans are underlain by basalt, the kind of thing you would see in Hawaiian volcanoes, for example. Um, and so that structure of core, mantle, and crust, which developed early in our planet's history, is probably the major structural determinant of how the Earth works. Now, go ahead. I was just going to say that now, if, if we take a few minutes and ask about process, I think the most important process for people to uh, understand is what's called plate tectonics. Yeah. And, and that's something that many people have, have heard about. And what it basically says is that the Earth's surface layer, the crust and a little bit riding on a, on a thin solid layer of mantle actually moves horizontally through time. Uh, this was first proposed 
uh, about a century ago by a man named Alfred Wegener, who called it continental drift. And we now know that to a first approximation, Wegener was correct. And so if you look at a, at a globe, uh, plate tectonics is in a major way responsible for what you see. So for example, there are places where ocean crust is actually converging with other crust and it sinks. Mm -hmm. And two things happen when it sinks. First, it generates friction, source of earthquakes. And two, as it sinks, it starts to melt, which is a source of volcanoes. So all you have to do to identify where oceanic crust is, is sinking is look where we have long lines of volcanoes and earthquakes. And you can go from basically Indonesia up through Japan, Kamchatka, the Aleutian Islands. That so-called ring of fire is where crust is, is sinking. Now, we at the same time, new crust is being made. And one of the, the great discoveries really right after World War II, as we started to map the ocean floor uh, for the carefully for the first time, was that, for example, in the Atlantic Ocean, there's a mountain range running right through, yes. through the ocean. It's, it's beneath the surface. So except in Iceland, you don't see it. But that's where new crust is, is forming. And so it's this combination of crust being destroyed, crust forming, uh, the surface breaks up into plates uh, with boundaries, hence the name plate tectonics. And again, not only do you get volcanoes where one uh, bit of, of, of one plate sinks beneath another, that's how we get the Andes and the Rocky Mountains, for example. Those are structural consequences of that. And sometimes two different continents will collide. That's yes. what gives us the Himalaya, the Alps, yeah. and things like that. So between them, then, to a first order, it's this physical structure of the Earth and the movement of the surface called plate tectonics, which I won't go into, but that's actually driven by the mantle underneath it. So yes. that, that's an important factor. But yeah. together, they go a long way toward explaining what you see when you look at a globe. Now, th what we see when you observe then in that case is not just uh, rocks and continents and so on, but also does this affect the atmosphere uh, and also the development of oceans, for instance, all of that together? Is that of a piece with this uh, tectonic um, uh, changes? Yeah, it, it is of a piece. There, there are other processes in, involved yeah. in these things, but certainly... It was the heating of the Earth's interior to begin with that drove what geologists call volatile materials from the forming Earth to the surface, and that includes water. Yeah. So very early on, the Earth uh, developed an ocean. Uh, it includes gases, the things that are gases at the Earth's surface, and that gave us our primordial atmosphere. Um, and, and what I find really fascinating is... Um, this is not a static thing. It's not like on a particular time the ocean was formed and it has been invariant ever since. Uh, in fact, there's reason to believe that early in Earth history, there may have been more seawater at the surface than there is today. Um, today, when these plates sink back into the mantle, they actually carry water with them. Um, and it turns out that the amount of water you can store inside the mantle is actually a function of the temperature of the mantle. Oh. So the mantle must have been hot. The earth has been cooling through time. And one of the, the consequences of a hot early mantle is that it can't actually contain much water. So uh, a number of people, in particular, my colleague Rebecca Fisher at Harvard, have shown through modeling that you know, today there's probably several oceans worth of water stuck in the mantle, but much oh. of that was at the surface three billion about years that. ago. So Earth was kind of a water planet um, for yeah. the first soggy you know, billion, two billion years of life. <laughs> yeah. Not, 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 not much land, actually. Yeah. Right, right. Under, understand. Well, the reason for asking about some of that kind of background is that 
we're the only planet that we know of with life. And it seems clear from your book that the chemical ingredients that, which are very widespread anyway, but the chemical ingredients and the conditions for life depended a lot on this geological factor, sure. this geological background. Could you help us understand that? How do these geochemical uh, factors make the conditions that enable life to emerge? Sure. Well, well let me uh, discuss that by making reference to a famous experiment that was done in the early 1950s by a man named Stanley Miller, who was a graduate student at the University of Chicago at the time. And what Stanley did was to take a, a flask, put into it carbon dioxide, methane, which is natural gas, ammonia, and water vapor. And that recipe came from what people at the time thought the early atmosphere might have looked like. And then he ran a spark discharge through it yeah. to simulate lightning going through the uh, atmosphere. And as Stanley's uh, experiment progressed, some brown stuff started accumulating on the flask walls. And when he analyzed it, it contained things like amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. So with that one experiment, Stanley showed that with the right kind of chemistry in the atmosphere or oceans or lakes for that matter, with sources of energy, which is probably not a problem, uh, one could build the molecular constituents of life from simple abiotic precursors. And there's been thousands of experiments since that time and the general principles very clear. So in a sense, what makes Earth a candidate for a biological planet is this very structure and composition of the planet itself, the structure and composition of the early atmosphere that accumulated by degassing from, uh, and, from yeah, the Yeah, and these conditions, I guess, at particular times, because it's not there just necessarily all the time, I suppose. But then on that origin of life, so we had the right kind of situation, presumably at the right time for life, to develop there, but the, the theory for origins has the, the most popular one is it just evolved one time, just occurred one time, like Luca, the uh, last uh, universal uh, uh, ancestor, uh, that it only developed one way. Is it possible that it has developed in different places, in different ways? Yeah, and, and in fact, um, many people would argue that on the early Earth, life might have started dozens of times. Uh, uh -huh. In a sense, all life that we know about today is related to each other and can be traced back yeah. to a common ancestor. But whether that was the only game in town or simply the one that survived is, is less clear. Uh -huh. um, now, I, I think that the question becomes in some ways more interesting when you ask could this happen somewhere else? Yes, um, and, well, and you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and the answer is, of course it could. Now, sure. uh, in our solar system, uh, the one planet we've been able to look at fairly carefully so far is Mars. And although Mars is not a place where you could do origin of life chemistry today, uh, it may have been four billion years ago. And there are... You know, there's evidence for liquid water and fairly climate yeah. conditions, at least episodically on Mars early on. So uh, a, a number of people, including NASA, with, you know, the current uh, rover mission on Mars, are looking for evidence to see whether life might have existed on Mars. There's a line of thinking that says that could have been true on early Venus as well. And if, if we accept those, what those tell us is that even though they may have been hospitable to life four billion years ago, neither one of those planets could support life today. So in right. some ways, the amazing thing about the Earth is not just that life formed here, but that it has been sustained for yes. four billion years. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's very interesting. And uh, I 
ask partly because we have these rather interesting conditions of volcanism and the tectonic plates and so forth. And there's interest in, uh, say, uh, some of Jupiter's moons. You know that they're, although those are water moons, in, for example, water, water moon, that there might be life there, but this life will be primitive. But with your geological scale, you, you would think, well, give it time or something, I suppose. But I th think what you mean is that it is far more widespread. It can emerge under, say, different circumstances. It's a potential all the time. We're maybe not that all that unique. But you make a wonderful description of the emergence of things like, you know, bacteria and bacteria, and then the more complex uh, types of life. And one of the best is the emergence of plant life and on land and so on. Could you please give us a little description of that? Because that's, that's a really interesting. Sure. Um, you know, if you look around at the diversity of life today on Earth, um, it, the greatest diversity is on land. In fact, by a wide measure, you know, most animals are insects. Um, but we also know from the geologic record that that's a fairly recent development in terms of Earth history. Mm -hmm. um, the terrestrial biosphere, so-called, really only started to take shape somewhere on the order of 450 million years ago. And that's, that's just the last 10% of Earth history, maybe the last 15% of the history of life. So there's a lot of interest in how this might have happened. It's not clear to me, at least, that there is some big push from the planet, but rather there are changes in the ancestors of plants, and I'll, I'll get to that, what they are mm -hmm. in a second, that enabled them to thrive. After all, at its heart, photosynthesis is an aquatic process. It's, mm -hmm. It works most easily in water. And if you want it to work in air, you have to keep from drying out. You have to keep from being fried by radiation from the sun. There's a variety of, of, of biological prerequisites to be sort of large photosynthetic organisms on land. Now we know um, from the comparison of molecular sequences that in essence, land plants are specialized green algae. Uh, their ancestors are, were, were green algae. We know within the green algae what their closest relatives are. And we can really piece together how those, you know, in many ways biochemical um, prerequisites uh, accumulated to the point where things other than microbes could start to proliferate on the surface. And, and what we see is between about maybe 420 and 350 million years ago, there is this great flowering of plant life on land, a little bit like People talk about the Cambrian explosion of animal life in the oceans uh, earlier. Well, this is, this is the essentially Silurian Devonian explosion of land life. We go from tiny little plants, only you know a few centimeters high, to large trees. We go from things that just had naked photosynthetic axes to things that had uh, specialized leaves, things that have well-developed roots, things that have wood, and eventually things that have seeds. So all that takes place during this interval of time. And that in turn completely transforms the nature of the continent of, of, of uh, terrestrial environments. And not surprisingly, very soon after we start seeing evidence for macroscopic plant life, we see evidence of arthropods, scorpions first, yeah. but insects soon thereafter. We see evidence of fungi, which, you know, the tremendous diversity of fungi today in many ways reflects the fact that these organisms have evolved to take advantage of organic matter made by, by plants. Uh, there's a particular deposit in Scotland called the Rhiney chert, 
a little more than 400 million years old, and is just this remarkably clear window into early terrestrial life. And it shows that, you know, by 400 million years ago, you've got vascular plants, you have all sorts of algae, you have fungi, you have things called oomycetes, which most people have never heard of, but they've all heard of the potato famine in <laughs> Ireland, which was caused by oomycetes, and, and all sorts of other microorganisms. But basically, by 400 million years ago, the major constituents, both large and small, of terrestrial ecosystems were there. And then about 35 to 40 million years later, one last piece of the puzzle becomes apparent, and that is uh, terrestrial vertebrates. Amphibians have evolved from their fish ancestors. So yes. it, is, it is a remarkable transformation of the planet, and in a you know, non-trivial way, is a transformation that makes us possible. Yes, there are two things in here I'd like to get clarified. One is you, you're mentioning, you know, the with the emergence of plants on on the land. Uh, this is a major transition, and then it seems to affect soil. And you mentioned fungi, bacteria, and so on. And that's I don't think we have a general idea that soil is alive, <laughs> but in so many ways it is, and you make that clear. Could you just give us a quickie there on how the soil is such an important factor? And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point, that uh, soil is a hybrid. I mean, there, there are physical components to it, clay minerals and lots of yeah. other things, but um, it has organic matter. It is crisscrossed by roots, by fungi, by earthworms. And I think most scientists would agree that soil as we understand it is as much a biological yeah. phenomenon as it is a, a physical phenomenon. Certainly, you know, when we do Mars rover work, people talk about soils on Mars, but they know the, the, the better term is just regolith. It's, it's just little bits of stuff at the surface. It doesn't have the kind of characters that our real soils on, on Earth have. And it's, it's really that composition of the soil, which has nutrients in it and things like that, that really supports the land land life. So, you know, in a sense, people sometimes talk about ecosystem engineers, that is, organisms can actually transform their environment. Well, plants, fungi, and animals transform the Earth's surface. And one of the results of that was soils, which in turn are critical to the maintenance of diverse life on land. Yes. And another factor in this that is that you bring out so well in this book is that you have these periodic catastrophes. And it seems as though after every natural catastrophe and everything dies out, and so you know, a lot of it dies out, the earth is very severely uh, disrupted by volcanic, uh, uh, massive volcanic eruptions and ice ages and so on. But following these catastrophes, there's often a resurgence that makes some novel uh, developments. Is that true? And, and uh, is that an important thing in our planet? Unique thing, I should say. Well, we don't know whether it's, it's unique because we only have one, one thing to look at. But it, it is important. Um, I think, you know, the phenomenon you're describing is often called mass extinctions. Yeah. And there have been five generally agreed upon major extinctions in the age of, of, of animals. And without question, they are probably as important in shaping the life we see around us today as genetics yeah. is and natural selection. And it is true that in many, but not quite all of these major extinctions, uh, you not only lose species, but you lose the whole fabric of ecology. And as that comes back, we get new ecologies populated by the survivors mm -hmm. and they go on to become 
you know, important parts of, of, of ecosystems. Uh, maybe the best example, or at least for our personal interest, the, the, the most important example is that 66 million years ago, um, a large cl collision with an asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs. Now, mammals had existed for 150 million years along with dinosaurs, but mammals were basically relegated to being little things that lived in burrows or in treetops and basically stayed out of the dinosaurs way. When that meteorite hit, all the dinosaurs died, except for birds, that's another story. Um, but some mammals survived. And so as ecosystems re-emerged following the catastrophe, now mammals are at the center of, of terrestrial life and, and everything, all the mammals we see around us, including ourselves, are, you know, we depend on that moment in time when uh, animals emerge. So in a sense, you know, you sometimes see this happy talk about, uh, you know, mass extinctions are good because they renew the biosphere. Um, you know, with mammals writing the history, I suppose you can make that statement. If dinosaurs wrote the history, you'd, you'd <laughs> do something really True. different. And, and importantly, because I, I know we'll get into 21st century extinctions uh, before long, even though every time there has been a mass extinction, life has recovered and rediversified in, in new and interesting ways, the time scale for that is yes. millions of years. Yes. You know, if we lose a species in 2021, it is effectively, and right. everything it represents is gone forever. Right, I understand. I wanna dwell on that shortly, uh, uh, the, the distinction between these past kinds of changes and the one we're about to endure now. But I, before we leave this, I would just like to, ask us the emergence of humans also depended on a, I think, dramatic change in the er sort of uh, spread of grasslands uh, and uh, made uh, our ancient, ancient ancestors uh, change their pattern of life. Is that true? Yes, certainly um, the emergence of our immediate ancestors that have the kind of characters that make humans special today took place within in Africa within a time of major climatic change. And so our arboreal ancestors started by necessity of having to walk on solid ground for a while. And that led to one of the defining characters of the human lineage, which is we're bipedal. You know, we're, the, right. we're, we're the, really the only primate that, that is f fully bi bipedal. Um, it's very likely also that, that uh, this need to rove in that led to social changes. So in one way or another, and I, and I wouldn't argue that we understand all, all the details, certainly the framework within our ancestors became human was a framework uh, really measured out in major climate change. Yes, uh, and well, and I was going to say these sort of geological changes as well, because you, you get these changes and it, you keep seeing this in your book, at least does it so well, between those kinds of changes and evolutionary leaps in a way. Uh, it, it's most interesting and before we leave that completely, because I want to get into the human era directly now, when you do these studies, if, and, and including on Mars, what are the indicators for you? What, are, what do you look at? I know, I think you mentioned biomarkers, uh, the, but I ask this because recently there have been uh, papers on looking at DNA in soils, and this just is to reconstruct human or, or you know our human ancestors and so on. But what is the most reliable uh, indicator for you? 
Well, it, it depends on what, what you're looking for, of course. Yes. But, you know, one of the things that I've been, been fortunate to be able to participate in was reconstructing ancient environments on Mars by yes. looking at sedimentary rocks. And the reason you can do that, and we have lots of experience doing this on Earth, is that every sedimentary rock, that is rocks that are formed by the breakdown of pre-existing rocks to form sands or muds, or the precipitation of, say, limestone, uh, there are physical characteristics of those rocks that tell you a lot about the environment where they formed. And there are chemical characteristics that tell you a lot about the I environment. See. So, uh, you know, when I look at ancient rocks on Earth, that's the kind of thing I'm looking at in the first instance. Those physical and chemical characters, uh, they give us hints as to the availability of oxygen, as to temperature, uh, how was the composition of seawater changing, and through the work of an awful lot of people on an awful lot of rocks, we slowly get this sense of an environment developing through time. Now, having said that, for many of us, the most important thing that develops through time is life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, everyone is familiar with fossils, and fossils are um, some of the best indicators of ancient life we have. And, but there's also, a, a, again, a kind of a chemical component. In part, there are aspects of life that aren't preserved as skeletons um, that still tell us particularly about microbial life. So there are certain types of molecules, particularly um, things like sterols, your cholesterol tells a lot about you and mm -hmm. that in an altered form can preserve in rocks. Uh, there are other kinds of chemical indicators that can tell us whether or not there was a biological carbon and sulfur and nitrogen cycle. So we can get a lot of information from these things. And importantly, one of the really interesting things that's accelerating now is we can look at the chemistry of the fossils themselves. Mm -hmm. And as you alluded to, there's a whole branch of the human tree of life called Denisovians that we know about purely because somebody found a little bit of a finger bone in Siberia and actually got a genetic sequence mm -hmm. for it. And that showed that this population was distinct from modern humans and distinct from Neanderthals who lived at the same time in, uh, in, in Europe. So yeah, there's the, with, with every year, there are new kinds of proxies being tried and you know, some work, some don't, but collectively, we know an awful lot more about the details of our planet's environmental history than we did just 20 years ago. Uh, that's most interesting. And also, I have the impression that you are, can be, uh, get accurate dating much, much better. That has improved also. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, dating uh, the earth depends on radioactivity. Yeah. Pure and simple. And radioactivity was discovered by Henri Becquerel in uh, 1897. And within a decade of that discovery, there were people trying to look at radioactivity in rocks. Uh, the thought being, if we know the rate at which a radioactive material or radioisotope, if you will, decays to a stable daughter product, and then we can use that information to actually date the rocks. So uh, a guy named Jean, John Jolie, a polymath scientist in Ireland, probably the first person actually to use radioactivity to fight mm -hmm. cancer, among other things, but he dated some rocks from the Devonian period and said, yeah, the Devonian period was 400 million years ago, which is not a bad estimate. Uh, <laughs> at the same time in Scotland, a man named Arthur Holmes got really serious about trying to uh, date, date the earth. And through time, really as better instruments developed, uh, it became possible to use or minerals that harbor radioactive isotopes to date the uh. earth. And, and of these, the geologist's best friend is a little mineral called zircon. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, zircon is zirconium silicate, not that important. But what's important about zircons, which form most commonly as part of the differentiation of granites, um, as zircon crystals form, they incorporate some uranium. And uranium has actually several radioactive isotopes that will decay to lead, but zircon does not incorporate lead. So if you find any lead in a zircon crystal, it has to be lead that was generated by the breakdown of uranium. And that gives us a clock. In fact, it gives us two clocks from two different isotopes of uranium. And that has helped us to date our planet's history again with a, a, a uh, precision and, and reliability mm -hmm. that even you know when, when I was born would have been considered uh, science fiction. Yeah. So it's really amazing these just giant leaps in terms of the science. Uh, Dr. Knoll, we have only a few minutes left and I had hoped to spend more time on this and that is your uh, it, the, what you described in here as the human, I would know what we should say contribution to the planet, but the human impact on this planet. We've had natural catastrophes, natural extinctions, but humans are responsible for so much of what is happening now. Could you give us a little background there about what the difference is, how humans have impacted the planet that is quite different from previous uh, negative impacts. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the, the first thing is to say that humans are a potent geologic force yeah. in the 21st century. Um, you know, I, I often talk to people who can't imagine that, you know, little old me can be as important yeah. as the volcano. But in fact, you know, humans actually release a hundred times as much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere every year as all the volcanoes put together. And uh, in many ways, we have become a force to be to be be reckoned with. Now, when you look at the evidence of human impacts on the biota, uh, they are strong. 10% of all indigenous mammals in Australia have gone extinct within the last 200 years. Uh, population sizes of everything from insects to, to mammals and birds are plummeting around the world. And most of that is due to changes in land use, you know, agriculture, which of course we need, uh, pollution, uh, over-exploitation of species that's what's responsible for a majority of the world's commercial fisheries being in trouble um and so that's really what is responsible for most of what we can see that has happened so far but of course going forward all of these things are going to continue but they're continuing in an environment that is changing uh, the earth is getting warmer. The earth, many places, the earth is getting drier, uh, you know, and this is a result of humans, right. largely humans burning fossil fuels and putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. And right. again, I won't go into it now, but th this is not conjecture. We can measure right. the amount of CO2. We know what its chemical effects are. We know because of chemical fingerprints that it comes from burning fossil fuels. And we know the earth is getting warmer and, you know, you have to be not paying attention to know that we have around the world, you know, some of the, the, the worst fires, natural fires That's that we've right. seen because of drying. Uh, you know, 110 degrees in Portland, Oregon yes. earlier this year. But just a week ago, the hottest temperatures ever recorded in Europe. Yeah. And, and this, this is, you know, the, the yes. earth is changing and we are responsible for it. So I guess the, you know, in some ways, you could say, well, geologically, we're just doing now what massive volcanism did in the past. The difference, of course, is that because we are the problem, we can be the solution if we choose to be. And I, I think not, yeah, we, we, just, have we just to have to choose to be. Exactly. Um, 
you had a few points on that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And I had hoped to uh, probe a bit more on that one because this is so important. It was the, the final point in the book that we have to take responsibility for the conditions that we have introduced. And much of it is unnatural. It's not like the materials and the, and, and the processes are not like previous ones. I regret that we have to end this because we've run out of time. But Dr. Noll, thank you ever so much for this wonderful information. And I hope that people will read this book and that teachers will use it and, and so on. It is excellent. And thank you for doing that work for us. Thanks very much. Okay. Goodbye now. Bye-bye.